I've heard again and again, a woman can certainly write letters, but writing for publication, boy, that, <laughs> that is a man's world. The woman's place is in the home. She should not be writing for publication. You can already tell my father didn't agree with that when he took my Flower Fables uh, manuscript to Mr. Briggs. This evening, we are very pleased to recognize the birthday of Louisa May Alcott on the eve of what would be her 186th birthday. Born November 29th, 1832 in Germantown, Pennsylvania and raised in Boston and Concord, Louisa is known as one of many literary figures of the day who contributed to fundraising for Old South Meeting House in the wake of its near demolition in 1876. Um, one more um, person who contributed, like this is another fun story. Um, some of you might be familiar with this little book um, about Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, Mary Sawyer, the namesake of the children's rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, also contributed to the cause of preserving this building in the um, well, somewhere between the late 1870s and early 1880s. Um, she donated cards with mounted scraps of wool from her lamb's fleece to be sold at fundraising fairs here. Um, and this is a picture, and I think there's a version of this picture, yeah, it's in the back there, just um, image of one of those fundraising fairs um, that I think likely, if anyone wants to see this afterwards a little bit closer up, I'm happy to share that also. But I happen to love that, that image too. Um, these, the play, this space in here was really transformed into all different kinds of interesting worlds um, and all sorts of things were sold just to benefit the basically paying off the mortgage on this building. Um, so Louisa May Alcott was one of the literary stars who drew crowds to these fundraising fairs. She had stood in the crowd outside me the meeting house in June 1876 when demolition appeared imminent. In fact, on the day that the clock was removed, the tower clock was removed from the steeple as the first act of destroying, basically t taking the building apart um, to be sold for its parts. And she became one of the early proponents of the historic preservation that saved this site for future generations. So we're really glad that she can join us today for a visit. Um, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about what to expect with this performance that you're about to see. Um, this performance is a blend of stage drama and living history. In a living history portrayal, an actor becomes a character, just as they do in a play, but unlike in a play, the audience may interact with the character and ask questions or make comments. You don't need to be an expert on Alcott's time period, which was from 1832 to 1888, to speak to her. You can just be yourself. But remember, she will know nothing of this century. She will know of this place because she has been here, uh, but she won't know about the 21st century. If you do have a question for Miss Alcott, we ask that you let us know by raising your hand and we'll provide one of our microphones to you so that everybody can hear your question. Uh, Miss Alcott will come in after having a minor carriage accident and will be waiting for repair. I'm sure she will be most grateful for your company. Now, if you will, prepare to travel back in time to meet Louisa May Alcott. Oh, oh, excuse me. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought I heard my name. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, Miss Alcott, I, I think you should come in. I, I think these people would, would like to, to hear from you. I'm not interrupting you. Oh, no, no, not at all. Well, Please. the gentleman who took my carriage to the livery said someone wanted to meet me, and I've been wandering about trying to find... I didn't... He meant all of you? <laughs> oh, my word, I didn't know it was so many. Oh, my goodness. He told me that you might have heard of my book, Little Women, and you might want to know about, more about it, and, well, I never dreamed it. And I, I notice you're dress reformers, too. <laughs> oh, I like that. Ladies in pantalettes. <laughs> I begin to see why he thought I should come in here to meet you. So you were curious about my book, Little Women? Definitely. 
Well, I never dreamed that people would receive it so well. I thought that my life was entirely too odd and dull to write about. When I was younger, I did like making up stories very, very much, but they were always fantastical tales, things that had nothing to do with my real life. And it was years and years of writing those kind of tales before I ever got interested in trying my hand about writing real things. Now, some of you might know some of my early stories. If, if you do know Little Women, I write about that. Joe March, of course, is based upon me. People get so upset sometimes. They say, oh, I think she's entirely too independent. I don't like that Josephine. They don't know that not only did I base her upon myself, but I didn't make her half bad enough. <laughs> and in Little Women, there is a portion of it where the girls are putting on a play. And Josephine is going to play the part of Rodrigo, or the bandit's bride with a mustache and boots that stole the show. That is real. I wrote that. I played that part. My sisters and I did put that play on for a Christmas present for our friends, and we put many such plays on again and again and again. So that sort of writing was all based on, on horrible things. I, I was inspired by Shakespeare, because you know in Shakespeare's tragedy, someone always dies a horrible death, and it's very exciting, and there are witches and that sort of thing. I used to upset our public librarian in, in Concord by asking for books on poisons and murder. So those were my blood and thunder tales, and I enjoyed writing them very much. And then, some of you might know of a story that I wrote when I was, well, let me see, it was published when I was only 22. Have you heard, any of you, of flower fables? Well, that was, someone knows of it. Well, that was something that, well, first I should ask, have some of you walked around Walden Pond in Concord? Some of you have. Was it before 1862? It was. You might have met our friend Henry, Henry Thoreau. We lost him in 1862, but he used to take my sisters and me berry picking and friends along the way. And being 15 years older than I am, he was entrusted to really instruct us. He could identify any animal track whatsoever. He could make bird calls so perfectly that the birds would answer. And it was always a joy to go walking around Walden with him, picking the berries, learning things. I still remember one time I saw him leaning so tenderly, looking at something, and I hurried over. I thought, oh, it must be a new animal track. He looked so, so very curious about it. And when I got there, I saw nothing but a cobweb on a leaf. Well, what was I missing? I'm looking. And then, with a twinkle in his eye, he said, what do you see here, Louisa? I see a spider's web. Still with that twinkle, he just shook his head. That is the handkerchief of a fairy, he said. And suddenly I could imagine the little fairies and elves washing out their fairy laundry, the fairy linen, you might say, and laying it to dry. And I could imagine them frolicking, doing all sorts of things, sliding down leaves, playing in water droplets. I imagined the little clothing they could wear, a flower could become a hat. And Ellen Emerson, some of you might know her father, who is my father's closest friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ellen Emerson, being six years younger than I am, used to adore hearing stories that I would just make up spontaneously as we walked along. And I started to make up stories about fairies and elves and the human children who encountered them. Well, that became my first book, and I called it flower fables. Now, you may wonder, well, if you were just telling these stories aloud, how, how did it become a book? Well, I 
was asked repeatedly to tell that story you told last week. Have any of you ever made up a story spontaneously for a child? Some of you are nodding. Is it not true that they remember it better than you do the next week? Well, this is what I was encountering with Ellen. So I decided I would, to the best of my ability, write the stories down and give them to Ellen as a present. I even sewed the pages together like a little book. And Mr. Emerson was so impressed with these stories, he showed them to my father. And my father carried them here to Washington Street and showed them to George W. Briggs, a brand new publisher who brought out the first edition in 18. 54. Well, the first copies in 1854. The book itself actually came out in 1855. And it was my first real book. Before that, I had been published short stories and little things, poems in newspapers, but never a book that you could go into a shop and see it sitting there on a shelf. I know I sound a little bit like a peacock, but <laughs> I was very thrilled. But again, nothing about my own life. Now, if you know my book, Little Women at All, you might remember how it begins. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. Oh, so dreadful to be poor. Oh, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner, and the four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at these cheerful words, but darkened again when Joe said sadly, haven't got father, shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say, Perhaps never. But each silently thought it, remembering father far away where the fighting was. And I know you remember that fighting. I'm sure many of you were involved with family members and great sorrow. And sir, you look familiar. Did, did you fight at Fredericksburg? No. Oh, you, perhaps a brother or a cousin. You look so familiar. Oh, perhaps. I should explain. In Little Women, father goes off to war. He serves as a chaplain for the Union Army. I changed time. I was writing about my real family, but I took our young years, which had been lived before the war, and I moved those years into wartime. That way, father could be younger, father could go to war, everyone would understand why the March family was so poor, because it was wartime and father was away. And this was really part of why I ever came to write Little Women, because I am really the one who did serve in the war. I served as a nurse for the Union Army. And when I was there for the first time, I really wanted to write what was happening around me and did not mind it being shared. I sent letters home that described everything that I saw, things that I was feeling, and those letters were published in the newspapers. And James Redpath read those letters and came to me and asked if he could publish a book. Would I enhance them, write more? And we would call that book Hospital Sketches. And he called it reality writing. And he said, Miss Olkin, I think you've found your style. Reality writing suits you. This was the first time that I had done such a thing. Take, instead of Rodrigo and the witches and, and the little fairies, I was writing about real people that I had encountered. Now, I changed all the names. And, and should your cousin or your brother be in the book, don't worry, I've changed the names. I don't even call myself in this book Nurse Louise Mayolka. 
I'm Nurse Tribulation Periwinkle. And all the names were changed. But the heart of the story is true. Sometimes I would take two or three people and put them into one to make things flow better. I wanted to take this person's experience and that person and put them together. Otherwise, it would just drag on too long. I needed to be concise. And suddenly, it, it seemed like a good idea to write in such a way. And then Thomas Niles of Roberts Brothers here in Boston read Hospital Sketches and wrote to me and asked, would I write the same sort of reality writing about girls, a girl's story? How could I do it? I thought I, I never knew many girls except my sisters. And as I told you, I thought we were too odd and dull. But our all cut sinking fund kept sinking lower. Some of you may know my father did a great deal of teaching and philosophizing, and neither of those pursuits produced very much help for a sinking fund. Although mother and my sisters and I adored what father was doing, I thought how brilliant my father's teaching ideas are, especially now that I'm grown. I, I do think this, but, well, for example, he was the first to admit a negress into his classroom, and this incurred a great deal of wrath and sort of a trend of having to move again and again and again and start a new school, and at one point we started Utopia out in Harvard, Massachusetts, and well, there was a lot of moving around, and that was difficult. And lo and behold, to help this Alcott sinking fund, when I presented the book to Mr. Niles, I decided I would try it as an experiment, he thought it dull. Why bother? Except he decided he would give it to his niece, and she adored it and gave it to her friends. And Mr. Niles decided to publish, and suddenly the first edition was sold out in, in no time at all. Mr. Lowe in London wanted to bring out an edition there. Other countries were beginning to ask for it. And well, my Dutch publisher wrote to me recently and said, Miss Alcott, it seems that ill-tempered, ill-mannered, ornery girls all over the world want to read about themselves. <laughs> so the All Cut Sinking Fund has risen. I'm very grateful about that. And I myself have had many, many visitors now. They come just to the door sometimes. They knock. They want to see the house of the little women. Might we come in? Could we have your autograph? I do get a little porcupiney about it. Well, it's hard to get anything done. But I also am grateful that people like my writing, that I am now able to, to produce works that seem to be pleasing people, but also helping the family. And my, my family has understood very well, even though they are portrayed in the book, they do recognize that the changes that I've made, I, I tried really to keep it all very quiet, but almost in, in no time at all, people have figured out who everyone is. And they write mail to addressed, for example, to Meg March, Concord, Massachusetts. That's all it says on the envelope. And the postman knows to bring the letter to Mrs. Pratt, because my sister has married John Pratt. Now in the book, you may note that Meg and I should tell you Meg's wedding was based precisely on my sister Anna's wedding. Meg marries John Brooke. And I had a bit of fun with that because my actual brother-in-law John Pratt's family had lived at Brook Farm. So I would have a little fun doing things like that. But do you know, I never dreamed that people would do things like that. They'd know to write letters. And my sister Anna, who is Meg of course, answered letters. So I'm, I'm astonished at what has happened, and, but in some measure, of course, I enjoy it, and in some measure, I say it is my worst scrape. You know, Josephine is always getting into scrapes. My worst one, it turns out, is fame. And yet, I'm delighted that the sinking fund is rising. So we have, we have always in life, I suppose, some things that are, that are both sides of, of um, the one experience provides both good and bad. And I'm grateful for friendly people. I, you know, to see all of you smile when I said little women, that was very encouraging to an authoress. And when I 
meet people who say to me that they, they got courage or encouragement from my book, well, that is, of course, wonderful for me to hear as well. So I'm not complaining, but I am a little bit protective. Sometimes my little nephews, um, you know, Anna has two boys. And I should tell you that um, when Anna had the boys, it was a joy because I have married my pen. And when you marry your pen, books will be your children. So we're delighted that Anna has real children because her children love us, but my children feed us. And this has worked out very well. Freddie and Johnny, so delightful, my little nephews. They call me Aunt Weedy because they can't quite say Louisa. They come frequently to visit. They've even lived at Orchard House, our home in Concord, where I wrote Little Women, often. And sometimes when I'm in the garden with one of them, I see sitting on the fence a reporter sketching us as fast as he can, and I, I feel as if we have no privacy at all. But I will say that it has been also very fulfilling to know that people like to know about my family, and so this dichotomy of the two feelings continues all the time. But you know, when I meet people in this way and they want to ask me questions and they want to come in and see the house and they want my autograph, I wrote a little poem about that recently. I wrote, of all sad words, the saddest are these, to an author's ear, an autograph please. So when they ask for these things, even if I feel a little porcupiney about it, I often will think, well, I do remember when I was struggling, when I was encouraged by someone, and I look upon people like yourselves, here you are keeping company with me when my carriage is being repaired and I have no idea when it will be ready. If some of you had trouble upon the roadway, you know what it's like, you're at their mercy. I don't even know quite which livery my carriage has been taken off to. But when I'm with lovely people like yourselves, I will share a little something with you that I wouldn't normally do. I don't mind answering questions from kindly folk like yourselves. Now, if you should come up with one, just feel free to ask. And don't tell your friends that I ever said that, or they'll be knocking on my door and asking me questions. And this happens, as I say, without anybody telling them, they still come. But sometimes people have come with the strangest information. And this, again, I'm sharing only because I can see that you're very forward-thinking people being dress reformers. One day, someone came to Orchard House and knocked on the door and said that she knew that I had written some stories that were very exciting. And I thought, how did she find out? She must have been speaking with my sister Anna. And, and how was Anna so bold as to tell about some of my blood and thunder tales that I've written under a pen name? I never wanted anyone to know that a woman had written such stories. Well, they wouldn't have published them if they thought a woman had written them. But to help that all cut sinking fund, this was, of course, before I wrote Little Women, I was writing rather lurid tales. Would you like to hear a small part of one of them? Only because you're so forward thinking. One of them was Behind a Mask or the Story of a Woman's Power. Now, Miss Jean Muir was hired as governess for the Coventry family and she was a delightful 18-year-old young woman with beautiful complexion, lovely pink cheeks. Her hair was thick and beautiful, and she charmed the family. She could speak French beautifully. She was just what they wanted. But when alone, Miss Muir's conduct was decidedly peculiar. Her first act was to clench her fist and mutter between her teeth, I'll not fail again if there is power in a woman's wit and will. Next, she laughed 
and shrugged a too, true French shrug, saying low to herself, <laughs> ah, yes, the last scene shall be better than the first. She then knelt before the small trunk that held her worldly possessions and opened it. She removed a flask and poured a glass of some ardent cordial. which she enjoyed extremely. She then removed the thick, abundant braids from her head, revealing her scraggly locks. She wiped the pink from her cheeks, removed a few pearly teeth, slipped out of her dress, and revealed herself indeed. She was a tired, Worn, moody woman of 30 at least. <laughs> Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> I did have fun with these tales. I wrote some of them when I was in that Union Hotel hospital serving as a nurse in Washington City. I won a prize for one of those stories, but little did I know that I would soon do much better with my reality writing. So you see, one never knows. And when I've done such things, I've had to keep it a little bit quiet. And because you are trustworthy, dress reformer, forward-thinking people, I do trust you with that story. So, do you know when my parents were trying to teach us how they would want us to behave, they were always giving us opportunities to be ourselves. And I credit the fact that I could dare to do such things. I credit that entirely to my, my upbringing. Do you know that in an era when I've heard again and again, a woman can certainly write letters, but writing for publication, boy, that, <laughs> that is a man's world. The woman's place is in the home. She should not be writing for publication. You can already tell my father didn't agree with that when he took my Flower Fables uh, manuscript to Mr. Briggs. But not only that, much earlier on, my father built me a desk of my own. That was frowned upon, not only in polite society because of the strictures upon the weaker sex, but it was also considered dangerous, as physicians now say, many of them, that any kind of brain work such as writing will destroy a woman's health. Father doesn't agree, built me that desk. Mother gave me a pen with a little note. May this pen your muse inspire when wrapped in pure poetic fire. So I am fortunate indeed that my parents have encouraged not only my ambitions, but my young sister May, who has been painting a good deal, and I'm very proud of the work she has done. We've, we've sent her off to Europe to study, and she's enjoying it, but she's also doing wonderful work. She sent a painting back recently with an owl, and he's a taxidermy owl that she found in a junk shop in Paris, but he's very well done, and he's sitting on a book, and Mr. Ruskin, some of you know John Ruskin, gave a critique of my sister's pages of a book saying they were amongst the best he had ever seen. She sent this painting home to us in Concord and had written me a letter saying the owl reminded her of me. Well, they've always called me the owl of the family because I like to owl about late at night reading and writing tales and I guess I consider that an honor. I certainly love the painting. And you know, when I first came back from war, I was so ill, I had typhus and pneumonia and was treated with calomel, and, and my physician today does not advise taking large quantities of mercury, even though it is an emetic, and it, many physicians believe it will cure you, but it didn't suit me very well, I can tell you that. I was very weak, 
my sister May, before she went to Europe, painted an owl right above my fireplace in my bedchamber too. So now I have one above my bedchamber and one on the wall that my sister sent home to us. So I feel that I have had the most extraordinary upbringing. I'm proud of both of my parents. Mother always had such a good sense of humor. You know, when we were out at Harvard and, and started this utopia, Fruitlands, it, that was the darkest time for my family. That was very, very difficult. And mother would sometimes make comments like, um, a philosopher is, a, is like a man in a balloon ever wafting upward, but someone has to hold the ropes and keep them from drifting away altogether. You send Mr. Alcott out for a quart of milk, he's just like to bring home the cow. Now, that sort of humor was saved for times when we were not so strict as we were at Harvard. When we were there in our utopian community, we could not eat of any animal products whatsoever because our, our mandate was to do no harm to any living thing. We couldn't wear cotton because this was before the war, so that would per encourage the slave trade. We couldn't wear wool because that would deprive the, cheap, the sheep, and you may wonder what we wore. Linen, that's it, because that you could grow the flax, spin the linen, but I can tell you it's uncomfortable and too warm in the summer and it's cold in the winter. So we did have difficult times and yet even though my mother would say sometimes when reporters for example came and said Mrs. Alcott is it true there are no beasts of burden on this place because the men were going to plow themselves and not hitch up animals. My mother said no beasts of burden? Only one woman! So even with that However, my mother believed so much in my father, and I believe truly that they have always very much supported and loved each other. It's just that sometimes the mother's portion is a little bit too hard, and I always dreamed of making my family more comfortable so that especially my mother could take her ease, and I'm glad that now we are able to do that. And mother has enjoyed so much the works that her daughter has done and feels very delighted by the fact that her, all her daughters have fulfilled their destiny, except, of course, my little sister, Beth. And when I wrote Little Women, I put a great deal of my sister into the book. It's all completely true that I, as Louisa, felt that my Elizabeth was my conscience, just as Jo in Little Women feels that her Beth is her conscience. And even though it was the very hardest thing ever to lose someone that you love so much, and it was so untimely, she was so young, we have always called her our angel in the house. And I simply say she is more truly our angel. But it's a joy to see my sister May studying art and my sister Anna so happy with her husband John and those boys. And, as I say, having married my pen, I'm rather happy writing my, my books. Well, before I go off to find that young man with my carriage, I hope I'll find him again, do any of you have a question for me before I leave? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Elko, we heard that you um, were part of the preservation. Oh, the preservation of this wonderful place, indeed. So what, 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 why, why were you so passionate about saving this old building? Well, you know, Mr. Emerson has always been the god of my idolatry. I've always admired him so much. And it was really Mr. Emerson who brought all of this to my attention. And I have always felt that if we don't understand and treasure what has come before us, we are in danger of losing something precious in our lives. That, again, is a lesson from my parents. I was often taught by my father and my mother just right at home to understand history and to read some of the old uh, accounts. So I, I do value that intrinsically. And then to see a beautiful building like this. And we lived in Boston many, many times when I was growing up. So I was very familiar with how important a place like this is. And uh, my great, I'm trying to think how many greats, I would say great, 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 great grandfather, Judge Sewell. Does some of you know about Samuel Sewell? He is 
related on my mother's side. And we've always been very proud of him because he would get up in the pulpit of Old South and talk about the travesty of the witch trials in Salem. And he was de just devastated that he had been a judge in that trial, but recognized very early on that it was horrible and he would ask forgiveness for himself and, and ask for prayers for those victims. So again, another connection. We're very proud of Old South. Yes. Are you currently living in Lewisburg Square? Oh, you know, the, you must be a prophet, a little bit of a prophet, because I, I have to be in Boston a good deal of the time. And Father, as he's gotten a little bit older, he started a, an adult education program that he started first in his study in Orchard House and then built um, a building, a small lecture hall that he likes to call the Concord School of Philosophy and Literature or the Hillside Chapel. And he's so still busy with all of that and I need to be in Boston more and more and I have looked at a property. I may have to consider doing that. Oh, you are. I, I, did, did someone tell you that I was looking? Well, I, one of the other great authors in Boston, uh, Julia Ward Howe, lives in Lewisburg Square, and I could just imagine the two of you uh, in, enjoying an afternoon tea. Oh, I have always admired Mrs. Howe and, and her ability to, you know, Father had her speak at the School of Philosophy, and people, after listening to her speak, asked her to sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> and she did, she sang it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very lovely connection. Oh, someone else, could you pass that perhaps to, to this person? Oh, well, all right. I, all right, yes. <laughs> I don't know why this, this little stick seems to make such a difference, but it does, doesn't it? That's amazing. Yes? Uh, Ms. Alcott, you mentioned earlier that Shakespeare was an important influence in your writing, but any uh, work with uh, four young women uh, growing up uh, reminds one of Pride and Prejudice. Is that an important influence on your work? Yes, yes. We, my sisters and I, were encouraged to read everything. There was really, well, I suppose there might be some things that we just didn't know about, but generally speaking, yes. The Brontes and Austen and, and even Sir Walter Scott and of course Shakespeare and um, the Frank stories. I don't know if some of you know Mrs. Edgeworth's stories. I mean, we just read all the time. And of course, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan and the Bible, we read everything. I hope this isn't a rude question. Are you still a vegetarian? Oh, well, mostly yes, mostly yes. Occasionally, um, when a physician has recommended, and even with my sister Beth and when we were young, this would happen. Sometimes the doctor would suggest that you want to have a, a beef broth or something of that nature, but largely, yes. I wouldn't say that, that, there, have been, that there have never been times when we've had a little something that might not strictly fit that description. Do you drink alcohol? Very little. I would say that, um, well, Mother has actually made beer and we've made hard cider at Orchard House. The reason we have always been temperance people is because of the ardent, the hard liquors. But if in moderation one has wine or, or some sort of hard cider, uh, we have partaken of such things but in moderation. Yes, does anyone else have a question? I must soon go and find that young man because I can't afford to have him not know that, um, that I'm ready and that I've had good company, but yes. Did one of your sisters really destroy your manuscript? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, to be honest with you, uh, there, you're thinking of when May, well, Amy in the book, uh, was so annoying, and I will tell you that that is true. My young sister, May, was extremely annoying, but many, many things that just together built up to that point of how angry one would be if the manuscript was burnt. But how do you say that? This is the kind of thing she actually would do. She would take my dresser drawer when I was not home. If she was mad at me, she'd take my dresser drawer and just dump the contents out. 
And she'd do a number of things like that. And the cumulative effect made me furious. But it's just not as dramatic and interesting to write oh, this one and this one, this one. And how did she get so mad? And I really have worried about my temper being my downfall. And my mother actually, if you remember that part in Little Women, mother does say to Joe after Joe is so angry and doesn't warn Amy about the ice and then she goes through because she was so mad about the manuscript. I did things like that and I really did worry that I would ruin my life with this horrible temper and my mother actually did speak to me the way Marmee does in, in the book saying you think your temper is the worst in the world, mine used to be just like it and I've learned to control it, and I still hope one day not to feel it, meaning it is the anger. So all of that is built in truth, but there's a little extra drama in, in the incident. <laughs> Any other questions before I go? Well, it has been a delight to be with all of you, and I will tell you one more secret, only because you're so forward-thinking and you're so trustworthy. I can tell. I can see it in your eyes. So don't tell anyone. But I have a little way that I handle people whom I don't know. Now, if I met you again, I'd be delighted, because here you've kept company with me. You're so kind, but I might not recognize you. So I'm going to tell you this secret so that if this happens to you, you can say, no, 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 Miss Alcott, we met you at Old South Meeting House, don't you remember? And then it'll be fine, we can meet again. When I see someone coming up the walkway of Orchard House, and I don't recognize them, I run to the kitchen. I put on an apron, get the flower canister, I hurry back because I know they're going to be knocking on the front door. And when they knock, You're there to see Miss Alcott, are you now? <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, Miss Alcott's not at home. Good day to you. <laughs> they go away. <laughs> they think I'm the maid. But I don't want to do that to you. So you now have my secret. Keep it. And just remind me if we meet again. Thank you very kindly. Well, apparently, um, Ms. Alcott has had to leave. Um, but I did hear a rumor that um, Jan Turnquist um, might be somewhere in the crowd today. And I wonder if perhaps we might invite her to tell us a little bit about the movie that um, she has been involved with that is going to be um, coming out next year, The Little Women, the new Little Women movie um, that Columbia Pictures is going to present. Do you think that we should see if we can invite Jan to visit us for a few minutes while, if, if we can find her? Um, oh, and, and here she is. Um, <laughs> Well, it really is a great pleasure to be with all of you. And um, now, just try not to look at this part, and you'll see that I'm actually Jan. And, um, I, but I have loved uh, bringing Louisa May Alcott a little bit to life. It's always an interpretive uh, venture, so I can't know precisely some of the things that I say, but I've done a great deal of research, and my day job is the executive director of Louise May Alcott's Orchard House, so I have had a grand opportunity to learn a great deal about the time period, of course, Louisa herself and her family, and that has been so fulfilling. I have loved doing this. This is why now for two movies, actually the masterpiece Little Women series, which was aired on PBS this year, um, came the director and the executive producer came to Orchard House and then they had me come to Ireland and I was there for just about a month advising on that film because they had to film it in Ireland and they didn't want Ireland to look like Ireland. <laughs> they wanted it to look like New England. So that was a great experience. And then uh, the first person that I met in conjunction with the Columbia Pictures movie, I'm just grateful that these, these movie makers want to come to Orchard House and, and they, they want so much information. I mean, they're really doing their research. And the first person I met was um, Jess Goncher 
some of you might know that name if, if you're a follower of movies because he has done the production design for many, many, many major motion pictures. The only one that pops right into my mind is The Devil Wears Prada, but he's done many, many others. So he is the production designer. I didn't know this, though. I didn't know who he was. I just knew he, he had questions. And so I was providing him a lot of information, and he has built amazing structures based on Orchard House. They would love to film right in Orchard House, but unfortunately the Lexington Road has a lot of heavy traffic, heavy trucks. There are, are um, airplanes going right over Orchard House all the time. <laughs> it just wouldn't work very well. Not only that, but almost everything that you see in Orchard House, maybe about 85% of what you see when you're in Orchard House, was really owned by the Olcotts. So these are very precious items, very fragile sometimes, and if you have a camera crew, I mean, there's just no room for them to do anything, and if, they're, if they were trying to do it, they'd be worried about hitting something, and we'd be even more worried about them hitting something. So we did a lot of that kind of thing, trying to give them exact measurements and exact colors and everything that they needed to, to create the world of the March family, because people do know that it was based on the real Olcotts. So we had a lot of fun doing that. Um, I've had the privilege of giving tours of the house and answering questions of all the cast members. That, that was an amazing thing. And what was the biggest shock to me, this is very recent. First, I'll just tell you that they turned Harvard, Massachusetts into 19th century Concord because again, in real Concord of today, it, it's just, it's impossible too many parking meters and all those things that would be very hard to change. But in Harvard, they have a general store and a congregational church and a little space in between. And it was perfect. They could build facades in between the general store and they just changed it to the Concord General Store. And then, you know, they had a whole little village. Jess sent me a text when they were doing all of this work he had taken a picture of one of the signs. And I knew when I was working with him, even though I didn't know who he was, I didn't know how much sort of influence he had over everything, I could tell he had a mischievous sense of humor. You know, just being with, I mean, I spent days with him and, and he, I, just, I really enjoyed him. Well, that mischievous sense of humor came out in this picture that he sent me because one of the signs that he put up in Harvard said, Madame, J. Turnquist, dressmaker and milner, third floor. <laughs> I almost fell over when that happened. I also was privileged to, to have a chance to be an extra in some of the scenes, and I've enjoyed that a great deal. Although I can tell you, if, if any of you have ever done this, you, you know it is absolutely not a glamorous thing to do. The name that they give extras, we would say extras, that's what I've always heard, they call you background. <laughs> and there's a real reason for that because, sure, I was in some of these scenes, but I bet you'll never see me. You might see that there's a whole bunch of people over here, you might see bonnets, but I doubt that you'll know that it's me. But that's all right, it was still a wonderful experience. I enjoyed very, very much watching what they do and thinking about how much repetition goes into filmmaking because they'll do the same scene over and over and over, not because of the problem with the acting necessarily at all, but because they want this angle and then they want this angle. And maybe the director does want to change the tone or, or put an extra word in or something. I will say too that I did meet Greta Gerwig. I've been with her several times with the first time that she came to Orchard House, that was quite a wonderful thing because everyone's talking still about Lady Bird. And um, Amy Pascal, if some of you know that name, I, I didn't ever think I would meet her. I knew that they really wanted to do this version of Little Women, this new take on it, you know, to, because in 1994 was the last time they made it, and that's a long time now, um, almost a quarter of a century, right? So. Um, they, they thought it was time. Well, I wanted to really do it a few years ago, but Sony ran into some difficulty and, and they just couldn't do the project. But that had been a passion of Amy's. And she is still very much involved with, with movies, even though she went through a little bit of a hard time there a few years back when, I don't know if some of you remember, Sony was hacked by North Korea. 
And that really made a mess of things for them for a while, but I guess they have recovered and Amy has recovered. And um, so she, it's, she's very passionate about this film being accurate, but still a new take, if you will, you know, a fresh perspective, but not going off on a flight of fancy. As I say, it's always interpretive. What I do is interpretive. Any film or drama, there are going to be things that are not quite what you saw in the book. I don't know if some of you have seen some of the interviews about um, To Kill a Mockingbird that they're making for Broadway. And oh, the interview I saw recently really made me nervous a little bit because they've had to change it so much. They, they can't have children in it, so they have all the children as grown-ups looking back, and that's, but it might work beautifully. All I'm really saying is, the filmmaker, that's part of the art, they have to take liberties. Someone asked me recently, what did I think Louisa May Alcott would think about all these different interpretations? Because there have been ballets, operas, stage plays, various ones, straight stage plays and musical, and uh, of course, multiple movies. Some of you saw the Catherine Hepburn version, probably, the June Allison version, the Winona, Winona Ryder version, and of course there will be this new one, but there have been made-for-TV movies. Of course, there's the Masterpiece miniseries. People have sometimes said to me, how can they keep doing this? Aren't people sick of Little Women by now? And I said, well, I guess not, because they keep doing it. But what would Louisa think, they want to know. And now I'm going to admit to you, that my answer is partially based in what I think, because how can I know what Louisa would think? None of this had happened in her lifetime, and there weren't even movies and televisions and videos and all of that. But my suspicion is based not only because I think this, but because of what I've read about her. I think, first of all, she would be astonished, absolutely astonished. She'd hardly believe it. And then I think there'd be sort of a curiosity as she started to realize, oh, well, I guess I'm going to see this person, Catherine Hepburn, playing Joe March, and oh, now I'm going to see this one. I think she'd be thinking each time, well, I wonder what they're going to do. I wonder what they're going to do. <laughs> and I'm not sure that she would always be pleased. I wouldn't pretend to know which things would impress her and please her and which things wouldn't. I'm just pretty sure that she wouldn't like it all. But I don't think she would hate it all either, because she was a pretty open-minded person in, in many, many ways. And I think she always appreciated art, and this is certainly an art form. Uh, so anyway, that gives you a little bit of, of what it's been like, and I don't know if you have a question or two before we go and have cake. I think it's wonderful, by the way, that Old South has decided to celebrate the 186th birthday. I think she'd also be quite astonished by that, that anybody was still thinking of her on her 186th birthday. And this year, 2018, is the 150th anniversary of the publication of Little Women. It kind of goes on all the way through 2019 because part one was published in 1868 and part two was published in 1869. So those two years really together are the sesquicentennial of the publication of Little Women. But I will join you over there. If there are no questions, we can just go. And I guess someone famous once said, let them eat cake. <laughs> Thank you.